Filing an FBAR can be annoying and a necessary breach of privacy, and believe it or not, far more complicated than one would at first imagine. So the question becomes, do you really have to file an FBAR? Can you get away without filing an FBAR? Can you cheat the IRS by not filing an FBAR? Watch this video and we'll give you some insight. Hi, I'm Anthony Parent of Parent and Parent LLP, IRS medic, and I'm here to talk about what happens when you don't file an FBAR and if you can get away without doing it. And before you laugh, there was actually a time when you could get away without filing an FBAR and have zero consequences. And uh, it's important to understand the history behind it, and then it kind of makes sense. The FBAR filing requirement began with the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970, yet for decades, nobody really filed an FBAR, or if you did, it, the, the, the importance of it was never really seen. The reason why was because FBARs weren't enforced. Why? Well, because the FBAR is not an IRS form. It's a Financial Crimes Enforcement Network form, FinCEN for, uh, for short. FinCEN was in charge of, of administering FBAR penalties. Well, they didn't look at FBARs as enough of a issue to bother administering them, so no one ever really did anything. That changed as the IRS, the authority to assess FBAR penalties, switched to the IRS, and now the IRS looks at the FBAR penalties as a, as a way to um, penalize people for tax noncompliance uh, as well. Um, so in the last 10 years, it's all changed. FBAR penalties went from something the IRS didn't even care about, didn't even do, to now a key IRS focus, and it's something. Um, its agents are quite happy to impose. Now, what exactly is an FBAR? The FBAR is a report of foreign bank accounts. It's also known as FinCEN Form 114. A person or entity is required to file an FBAR if they have a financial interest in or signatory authority over at least one type of foreign financial account that exceeds an aggregate value of $10,000 at any time during the year. Remember how I told you it was a little more complicated than most people realize? Because the form says report a foreign bank account, right? But the instructions say a financial account. So that's why there's a lot of things that aren't foreign bank accounts that still have to go on an FBAR, according to the government. Pensions, life insurance policies, and accounts that earn no money have to be reported or else. So is it still possible to file no FBAR and get away with it? It might be. It might be. Um, but before you make that decision to sort of not do it, here are some things I want you to think about and to see how you fit into where this fits into, uh, if this helps you make the proper decision. Uh, the first thing is if you ever did file an FBAR, uh, you are now in the FinCEN database. Um, so once you're in a deba database, you can be tracked. If you're not in a da database, it's really hard to track you, right? Um, and the second thing to think about is, you know, what the penalties truly are, okay? Because there's a lot of fear out there of where people will say, oh my God, it's a 50% uh, penalty that it be, can be assessed multiple times that will completely ruin you. And it seems really scary. Yes, 50% penalties do happen, but that's where you see accounts over a million dollars. For the accounts that go under $250,000, even if you're found willful, which is the worst sort of standard, uh, the penalty will be about $10,000. Still outrageous in my mind, um, but it's not the ruinous amount. Um, and there's ways that we deal with um, reducing, um, you know, reducing those willful penalties, uh, at least mitigating through some other way or trying to argue for non-willful, uh, which is a, a maximum of $10,000 per year. Now, the other issue, because and this has recently been in the news uh, with the Paul Manafort case, uh, he actually was accused of not filing an FBAR. Now, if the only crime you're accused of committing is not filing an FBAR willfully, uh, that's a $250,000 penalty in up to five years in prison for not filing a form. I know, right? Pretty uh, crazy. And of course, they're not, they're not um, uh, imposing these penalties against the original target of the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970, which were your you know, international drug kingpins and, and organized crime. No, no, no. They're putting it against taxpayers and I guess political consultants like Mr. Manafort. Well, this is the thing that happens. If the FBAR violation occurs with another crime... Um, now the penalties are doubled uh, to $500,000 and up to 10 years in prison. Uh, so the thing is, you will never see, I I've never seen a naked FBAR crime. It's always involving a, a tax evasion crime too. So you're virtually assured if it is something that does, does go criminal that you'll probably be 
facing uh, that, that daunting $500,000 penalty in 10 years of imprisonment. And it's pretty hard to keep your cool, no matter how innocent you are or whatever mistake the IRS did make, when you're looking at that. And that's one of the reasons why 92% of people, when faced with a uh, cr uh, indictment um, involving the IRS, will plead guilty. Uh, the IRS does some other things, too. They'll, you know, maybe they'll indict your spouse, too, uh, to put some added pressure onto you uh, in order to take a really, really unhelpful uh, plea deal. Now, here's something else to think about. People who have grievances against you are more than happy to testify against you uh, in a court of law. But the other thing, too, is sometimes, you know, they have an incentive not necessarily to tell the truth. Sometimes they'll make up a story um, to make you look like you did something you really didn't do. You know, the important and critical thing about FBAR penalties for these willful penalties and these criminal charges is somebody has to prove what your state of mind was. Well, that's where they get testimony from, say, you know, a disgruntled business owner, an ex-spouse, or even a tax professional. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of tax professionals won't just say, oh, I made a mistake. I should have really looked into that and filed an FBAR for my client. They'll say, oh, I told the client he had to do that, and he intentionally didn't do that. Um, and that's really unfortunate because there's really no penalty if you're a tax professional who misses filing an FBAR for a client. I don't even know if they'd give you a slap on the wrist. There's really nothing there. It's a form that was ignored for years. And, you know, the entire, if you look at um, uh, international compliance as a whole, uh, the industry, uh, you know, except at the very high end, uh, generally fails pretty bad because international tax compliance is so complicated. Um, now, if you are wondering what happens if you do get an FBAR penalty against you, well, the, the, um, the government has to now go to court to perfect that judgment. They're able to um, assess uh, or they're able to attach your income and assets. And um, if you have now, here's something, if you have no income or assets, I guess you're winning right now, probably not. Um, but if your spouse does, and you live in something called a community property state, um, those are Texas, uh, California, in the Southwest, um, that the government can actually reach into the income and the assets of your spouse to satisfy this. So um, you might want to move if that's something uh, to consider. I would say this, um, and I talk with my uh, friends overseas all the time. If you are assessed an FBAR penalty and you live overseas, it's very difficult for the government to enforce that. Um, you know, the, the, the courts around the world, you know, they're not really all that uh, gung-ho for America in these FBAR penalties. A lot of them uh, have a, a bad taste in their mouth with the uh, FATCA, too, the Foreign Tax uh, uh, Compliance Act, um, really has uh, rubbed a lot of countries the wrong way. And so the chances of them um, allowing the IRS to bring their foreign judgment to another country to enforce it against you for FBAR penalties is really remote. Now, that's not the case with tax penalties because a lot of countries will assess, will help um, collect those tax penalties, but FBAR penalties by themselves, probably not going to get collected. Now, you may be wondering, well, what about this whole Eighth Amendment argument, too? I mean, come on, FBAR penalties clearly violate the Eighth Amendment's excesses, excessive fines clause, right? You know, if you're able to penalize somebody, you know, $500,000 on a million dollar account and there was no tax noncompliance, you'd have to really wonder, well, come on, that's got to be excessive. There was, you just took someone's money. Um, and you're right, it is completely excessive and it violates the Constitution in any meaningful way. However, the courts don't agree. Um, and a general rule, if you've been paying attention to the last 100 years, um, never expect um, the courts to limit government power. They just don't. They always find you know, majority of the cases, they always find in favor of the government power. I expect this to continue. It is possible to wait out FBAR penalties. It is. Um, right now, if you have an FBAR penalty, if you have an FBAR that is not filed for the year 2011, and today is June 5th, 2018, you only have a few days to go. Uh, before you will actually wait out that. Uh, your 2011 FBAR was due June 30th, 2012, so that means July 1st, 2018, you successfully waited it out. And I know some people are crossing their fingers hoping they're making it, but here's the thing. The IRS knows this, because I've talked to some people there, telling me they, you know, they'll tell me what they're up to. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I've seen some of this happen um, firsthand, while your statute of limitations of FBAR, you can wait out. There are certain statute of limitations you can't wait out. 
Now, one of the other obligations, if you do have an FBAR filing requirement, you might have an 8938 requirement if your accounts are high enough. Uh, if you're single living in the U.S. Uh, and $50,000 or more, you have to file an 8938. If you are married living overseas, the threshold's $200,000. If you don't file your 8938, there is no statute of limitations. It hasn't even begun to run. So the IRS can, can penalize you $10,000 per incident. Um, this happened, this was passed in the Higher Act of 2010, um, and 2011 was a first year of your 8938 requirement. So the IRS can go back to 2011 for any form 8938 that's missing and assess it for all these years. But we're not done yet. Uh, for so many of our clients, they just don't have form 8938, but they also have a form 5471. Very, very common to have it. Form 5471 is a form you have to file when, uh, typically when you have a foreign corporation that you control. Corporation doesn't mean an actual business that's making a whole bunch of money. It could actually mean a corporation that whole, uh, owns the condominium that you live in. Um, it's very common for U.S. people overseas to hold things in um, uh, limited liability entities uh, for asset protection. And also that's just sort of how business is done in a lot of places. Well, you have a 5471 obligation for that, and if you don't file it, it's $10,000 per year. And again, same thing, statute of limitations hasn't even run. So the IRS can go back, way, way back, to assess um, much, much further back than 2010 uh, to file, uh, to, to impose $10,000 penalties. And we're not done yet, because a lot of our clients also have uh, a foreign pension. And some foreign pensions, not all, some of them, uh, are required to file a 3520A. And a 3520A also has $10,000 penalties. Oh, and we're not done yet. Because if that pension, you got distributions from it, there's probably a form 3520 that needs to be filed. And that's $10,000 a year. So as I've gone through, some four very, very common forms that people with FBAR obligations also have are your Form 8938, 5471, 3520A, and your 3520. That's $40,000 a year that the IRS has an indefinite amount of time to assess for multiple, multiple years. So while it's possible to wait out the FBAR, it's these other penalties that really, really can come and really hurt really bad because so many years could be assessed. And the IRS is kind of, it, it's a really hard standard to get undone. You need to prove reasonable cause. And I would say the government's fairly unreasonable about reasonable cause. So this is why, this is why I conclude, you know, the best option, and even though it's a completely obnoxious form, uh, is to file your FBARs correctly. And if you haven't, um, get into a proper disclosure plan. Um, now, not everybody with unfiled FBARs needs a, a, a full-blown disclosure program, and you might have heard that the uh, Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program is closing in September of 2018. It is, uh, but for most people, that, that, that program is not what we were doing for them anyway. We're either doing delinquent FBARs only, or we were doing um, uh, a streamlined disclosure. That's typically the best option for most people right now. Um, now, um, how do I take some sting? out of this, right? We really don't like this. I really don't like the government just snooping around, collecting all this data that's in one database that can be hacked, right? I don't like it at all. Um, I mean, that's some really good intel if somebody got in there to say, oh, wow, here's a, here's a foreign dissident. Um, let's say there's a country out there in the world who, um, you know, people left. And I wonder if there's any bad countries in the world that kind of kill their own people a lot. And then maybe that person left and maybe lifted America, but they have assets overseas. What if that foreign agency was able to get into that database and now could find where that foreign dissident is now living. You know, see, that's what I don't like. Um, and now they could go send their agent there to go, um, you know, do something nasty. Um, so I really don't like it. I think it's, it's, I think it all, I think it makes everybody less safe and the government hasn't been using the FBAR for its intended purpose. So here's some things to maybe um, shine up uh, this uh, turd a little bit. Um, you know, the FBAR, intelligence is so low value to the government, okay? So if you think about it this way, by filing an FBAR, you're, you're actually bogging down the government bureaucracy. You're doing your part to slow them down a little bit. Um, now, here's the other thing too. This is probably a little bit better. There's really no such thing as an FBAR initiated audit. It doesn't really happen like that. There's some limited exceptions that, that I happen to know about, uh, but that's where someone else is doing something really also incorrect. Um, but the IRS, they don't begin audits by looking at FBARs. They look at 
their, their, their tax data to determine who uh, they should go for an audit. So don't think um, that filing an FBAR correctly is a red flag to get you audited. I mean, we've filed FBARs uh, for clients for millions of dollars in no other form, and nothing happens. Um, because, again, this intel is so low value. There's, what does it mean that someone is a signatory on an account that's $10 million? Is it their money? Maybe it's not. Maybe it's for their clients. This doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that they have any unreported taxes. It doesn't mean that they're a criminal, right? So that's why they just go into a black hole and nothing's ever done with them unless you didn't file one. Then they'll check to see if you did. The other thing, too, if you are going to come clean with the IRS, my advice is, is do it right. Don't do it all. Um, lying to the IRS or doing a half-cock job usually makes things worse. All right, so what did you think about this video? Are you tired about me talking about FBARs, or is there something more that you'd like me to discuss? Maybe the collection process or maybe some of the constitutional claims. Whatever your comments are, please leave them below, and be sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching.